a pastor was talking with a friend one time, and, uh, and he got a surprising question. The friend said, where is your church? Now, that doesn't sound like a surprising question to us, it, it, normal uh, kind of conversation. Uh, maybe it's the answer that was so surprising, because the pastor said, what time is it? What difference does that make? Where is your church? And you want to know what time is it? He said, well, looked at his watch. He said, it's 9 o'clock. My church is just beginning a school day. My church is serving breakfast at Cracker Barrel. My church is on the assembly line at BMW. I'm sure that my church is at Walmart. They always are. Because his point, of course, was the church was the people, not the building. And that's the New Testament understanding of church. A church is not bricks and mortar, although, thank God for those. They, they help us in our mission. They're indispensable, we think, for, for all that we want to do. This building is a, is a blessing. We're glad it's here. But the building isn't the church, not in a New Testament sense. The New Testament word for the church is ekklesia, and it means the called out ones. It's a word that's used uh, in secular Greek for an assembly of any kind. People, Greece was the, early, uh, was the home of democracy, the birthplace of democracy, and the citizens would be called out of their homes to vote, um, not just on the first Tuesday of November every few years, but on a lot of issues all the time, they would be the called out ones because they would assemble to vote. Well, the church was called out for a different reason, called out to worship, and even more to the point, called out of the world to be different for the sake of the kingdom. But that definition, the called out ones, reminds us that it's the people who are the point, and that's us. So even though in the New Testament, church isn't a building, because they were worshiping in homes. Uh, it, Christianity was illegal. They'd have to wait 250 years for the opportunity to actually worship in openness, uh, to, to have a, 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 a place of worship constructed, to, to have the the identity that goes with that made public, but they were still the church long before there was a building that was called that. And yet the apostle Peter, who was in on the ground floor of all of that, Peter who was at the birthday of the church, preached the sermon on the birthday of the church, the day of Pentecost, understood church very well. In this first epistle, Peter compares the church to a building. And we read in today's lesson, beginning in chapter 2, verse 4. Speaking of Christ, Peter says, As you came to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God, and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. If you were following in our quarterly or in your Bible, you saw the quotation marks there and the reference that Peter makes to as it is written. That always means it's in the Old Testament and he's actually quoting from Isaiah and from Psalms in this passage in reference to Christ the cornerstone. The church is like a building in that Christ is like its cornerstone. There are several metaphors in the New Testament that are used for church. And you know them very well. The church is a bride, and Christ is its groom. Uh, the church is a body, and Christ is its head. The church is 
related to Christ in a different way in the image that Christ used about his being the vine and the church is the branches. So when, when we talk about bride and groom, we're talking about a love relationship. When we talk about the head to the body, we're talking about leadership and authority. He is Lord. When we talk about the vine, we're talking about life uh, because the branches can't exist apart from the life-giving vine. The other image is a building, and Christ is its foundation. In all of these metaphors for the church, the key is the relationship of Christ, a new way of looking at Christ in relation to his people, his church. Bride, body, branches, building, they all have a different insight onto the same truth, which is Christ is Lord of the church. So Peter explores that idea of how is the church like a body, I'm sorry, like a building in today's lesson. Christ is its foundation stone. Christ is its cornerstone. That's where he starts. You've probably seen, um, especially on older buildings, uh, a cornerstone with an inscription on it. Uh, the date it was laid, the, the origin of that building dated, perhaps the names of the leaders who were responsible for the building of that building, or, or perhaps some sort of identification of the purpose of that building engraved on the cornerstone. It's the first stone that's laid, a prominent stone, often larger than others, intended to give a practical uh, serve a practical purpose. It, it sets uh, the direction for the building. If it's crooked, the building's going to be crooked. If it's out of place, the building will be out of place. But also to symbolize the foundation of the building and its support. This passage of scripture doesn't mean much to people who live in places where um, homes are temporary. Uh, where they don't build with masonry and, they, and, and stone is not common enough for them to use it on large scale for their buildings. Missionaries have begun to use the image of a tent pole to serve the same purpose. Christ is the center pole and all of the tent, no matter how small or large, is based on the support that it gets from that one critical place. So. Christ is that for us. In the biblical language, he's our cornerstone. And Peter says, in the midst of that passage I read a while ago, he is the living stone. This is a, 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 a sub-theme that runs through Peter's first epistle. Because in the greeting, he said to those Christians in uh, what we call Turkey today, Asia Minor, uh, Christ uh, is, has given you a living hope. And at the end of chapter 1, he says, we take our directions from Scripture, which is God's living word. And now he says, our Lord is a living stone who is the foundation and the cornerstone for our faith. You remember in the Old Testament story of Israel after the Exodus, they're in the wilderness, they have critical needs. Food, God sends manna, water in the desert. And, and Moses is instructed to strike a rock. Water comes from the rock, the people are saved. Paul says in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians, that rock was Christ. Now he doesn't mean literally, that's one of the analogies of scripture, it's one of the uh, figurative descriptions of Christ that multiply in the New Testament. Uh, uh, you know that, that Christ is a shepherd, that Christ is the door. Uh, there's, there's so many ways that Christ describes himself in terms of everyday things that we're familiar with and he draws lessons from those. Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Christ is that rock. <laughs> 
because as, as God provided for their needs in the wilderness, Christ is there for all that we need in the New Testament. So here is Peter. And you know that's not his given name. His given name is Simon. Peter's his nickname given by Christ. And what does it mean? Rock. Yeah. So here's this man whose friends call him Rock. And he is saying, Christ is my rock. Christ is your rock. He's a living stone. A testimony to the resurrection there. He's a living stone who is the cornerstone of our building. Peter has gone back to Psalms and back to Isaiah to bring forward this idea of a cornerstone and the important role that it plays in the edifice. And he is saying, that's another way to look at our Lord. Yes, he's the good shepherd. Yes, he's the door. Yes, he's living water. Yes, he has the bread of life. All of those are beautiful pictures. Here's another picture. He's the cornerstone in the building that is the church. Not a church building, but the people of the church are anchored in Christ. We have uh, a beautiful contemporary chorus to remind us of that. Maybe you've sung it, Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm he is Lord Lord of all it's very possible and when Peter wrote this describing the church in terms of a building describing Christ in terms of its foundation stone that he was remembering something that took place in the final days of Christ's ministry in the gospels during Holy Week that week between Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Jesus and the apostles are, have been in the temple precincts. He, he did much of his teaching there. He also had many conflicts there with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and others. And as they are leaving, Jesus has trouble getting the disciples to come because they're sidewalk superintendents. They're watching the construction crew as the Herodian family is, is working, as the Herodian family is funding the rebuilding of, so that the workers are there working on the, the restoration of the temple. Solomon's temple was destroyed in the Babylonian captivity. When they were released from captivity, they built the second temple, but it was on a much lower budget. You remember we talked about that when we looked at Haggai. Uh, much lower budget, so much that the people wept when they compared what used to be to what was now. And God said, no, this is even greater because Messiah will walk in this temple. Well, now we're 500 years later. And, and the Herodian family, in seeking to gain some points with the people, is spending a lot of money in restoration of that second temple. And the disciples are amazed they say to Jesus, look at the size of the stones. They must have been incredibly large. Um, you, that's human nature, right? We want to stop and watch this building going up. And Jesus said, don't get too attached to it. That building's coming down. There won't be one stone left on top of another. And, and just a generation later, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, that's what happened. The temple was destroyed, has never been rebuilt since Temple Mount in Jerusalem has no temple on it now. Um, it's got some Muslim mosques and shrines, but no temple. Peter may have been thinking back to that day when he and Jesus had that conversation about how big those stones were and how important the role that they played in the building was. Well, if that's the case, Peter sees very clearly that in spiritual terms, Jesus is that cornerstone for us. A living stone who makes all the difference in the world in the construction of the church. But that quotation from Psalms, from Psalm 118, says when the builders saw the stone, they rejected it. And they said it's not worthy to be the cornerstone. That was written hundreds of years before Christ and Peter. But Peter goes back to that verse and says, you see, that's what happened. 
on Good Friday, the builders rejected the true cornerstone. That construction crew that we saw working in the temple, they didn't know the true cornerstone was standing there with us watching them. But he was about to be rejected and before the week was out, he would be crucified. They refused to accept, the Jewish religious leaders refused to accept God's cornerstone. The one that gives shape to the building, the one that gives support to the building, and they left it unused. That's the wording in the Old Testament. The stone the builders rejected has become a stumbling stone, Peter quoted. Here's, here's my take on that. Picture the construction site. A truck pulls up, it's delivering the cornerstone. The architect and the contractors all take a look at it and they say, no, that won't work, even though it's perfect. Mistakenly, or maybe it intentionally, sinfully, they reject that perfect cornerstone and just leave it on the construction site. It's supposed to be in the building, they leave it on the site. And then every time they walk past, they stumble over it. They stumble over it because it's not supposed to be left out there. It's supposed to be in the building. It's essential to the integrity of the building. It's actually kind of a funny picture to imagine in your mind how many times a day they trip over the stone that's not supposed to be there on the construction site. And they will trip over this living stone again and again and again and again because they rejected the one that God had set to be that foundation. So the first part of Peter's picture is this, if we look at the church as a building, I know what its cornerstone is. Now, after that, Peter goes on to say, let's talk about the church that stands on that foundation. Still in this imagery of what if the church were a building. You, like living stones, he said, are being built into a spiritual house. Peter takes that Old Testament idea of a, of a rejected cornerstone and he amplifies it to say, well, I know who the rest of the building is too. It's us. We're the building that rests on that cornerstone. This building of the church has been under construction for 2,000 years now. And, and you thought that construction project that you looked at every day was gonna take a long time. That's where I am right now in my life. <laughs> But the church is being built and will continue to be built until Christ comes back. A generation after generation, this is a church under construction. And you and I are the stones, living stones, he says. Now, Jesus is a living stone who is the cornerstone. Jesus gives life to us and makes us living stones as well in the construction of the building. I think churches are some of the most beautiful structures in the world. Um, I, could, I could stay days in a cathedral. Uh, but, the, but also the, the beautiful little country church, white clabbered church on a hillside. Or how about that, <laughs> that uh, inner city mission downtown that's in low, low budget territory but it's doing such beautiful work in reclaiming lives, in bringing hope to people. I think churches are beautiful no matter what they look like. That's the way God looks at his church metaphorically. That's the way God looks at us. And he sees something beautiful. We may have trouble seeing how beautiful we are, but God sees something beautiful worth dying for in the church that he is building. That's what Peter had in mind when he added this part. This begins in verse 9. But you, speaking to his readers then and now, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you. And remember, they're the ecclesia, the called out ones. The God who called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Speaking to Christians, he says, you're a chosen people, you're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, you're God's special possession. Every one of those phrases was used in the Old Testament of Israel, the Old Testament people of God. And God's plan was that that would segue into the second covenant, the new covenant, God's New Testament people. But look how many said no and rejected the cornerstone. So in Peter's analogy here, Peter, like the other apostles, Jewish himself, Peter says Israel was God's chosen people, so is the church. As the New Testament, as the second covenant people of God, he says Israel's priests were a link between God and his people in the Old Testament. He says, so are you in the New Testament. Uh, priests in the Old Testament offered animal sacrifices. And we don't. There was a sacrifice offered once for all on Calvary for us. But we're still called in the New Testament to offer ourselves as sacrifices, right? Living sacrifices. Living stones who are also living sacrifices as priests of God in the New Testament. Martin Luther had a revelation about that. And he began to teach the priesthood of all believers. He began to teach it in a day when even in the Christian church, people were told you had to go through the priest for this and that and the other. And, and in 1 Peter, Luther pointed out, Christ said all the living stones that make up the church are priests of this new order that God has set in place. Priesthood of all believers means you and I don't have to go through any human agency to get to God. We have direct access. Now, thank God we have pastors and counselors and Christian leaders. There are aids to finding peace with God and to growing in him. But uh, they are spiritual helps. They're not spiritual requirements. You and I have direct access to God, which is what the priests did in the Old Testament. Paul said, or Peter says, you're now a royal priesthood yourself. He goes on to say, Israel was a holy nation. You're a holy nation. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to a variety of people in five different provinces in Asia Minor who would be of different nationalities. He's talking to some people who are Jewish and some people who are Gentile. He's talking to a mix of people in his original uh, uh, address of this letter. But think how many he's talking to now, two, uh, 20 centuries later, uh, as it's in inspired scripture and it's being read by everybody all over the world. And the words are, you're a holy nation. The holy nation now is not a geographical spot on the map. The holy nation is a spiritual nation made up of all of those who are part of the church of Jesus Christ around the world from every nationality, of every language, every culture, just like heaven will be. That's true now on earth, even though it's more difficult for us to experience that because we're separated. We are linked to, we are a part of every other believer who is in faith in Christ anywhere in the world. Israel had been a holy nation. The church is now a holy nation. Now, 
that means America is not what he has in mind here. And uh, sometimes I'm afraid we act like it is. I say we. People in general in our nation act like it is. Uh, God has used America in wonderful ways to advance the gospel, but he used Europe before he used America, and he used Asia before he used Europe. There's nothing unique about us in that sense, and we're not acting much like a holy nation. But the people of God are a holy nation. Now, that's not woke theology, okay? That's biblical theology. We, as the people of God, are a holy nation, and it transcends national boundaries. The fourth thing he says is Israel had a temple that marked its relationship with God. And he says, today, you are that temple. We, as the people of God, are the temple in this new age. Now, none of this says that God is through with his Old Testament people. In fact, Paul says in Romans, there's a revival coming among Jewish believers uh, uh, um, uh, to create Jewish believers, to bring people into the fold out of their Jewish heritage into Christian faith. And we can pray and long for that as Paul himself was longing for it in Romans. Doesn't mean that God's through with his Old Testament people. He has plans for them too. But it means that God is not limited to that Old Testament covenant, but in a new covenant, you and I have the privileges that once was reserved for Israel. Privileges of being chosen. Privileges of being priests. Privileges of being a holy nation and a people set apart for God. Privileges of being a temple. We don't have a temple, we are the temple. One of the verses that's, uh, that we often hear quoted to us about taking care of our bodies is that we're the temple of God. And we're understanding that to be in a singular form. My body is a temple. I, I need to treat it with respect and care for it. But you know that several of those places in the New Testament letters that refer to the, the temple of God are in the plural. It's not just you, singular, are the temple of God in your own body, and so am I. But we together are a temple of God that needs care, that needs uh, attention, that, that we should cultivate and, and make sure is everything that God has always intended that to be. It's just another way of saying we're living stones in a new building, a metaphorical building, a figurative building called the church. Well, that memorable place in the scripture when Peter said to Jesus, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Do you remember what Jesus said? You are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. Catholics and Protestants have a different understanding of that passage. Catholics believe that, that Christ was naming Peter the first pope and leader of the church. Protestants believe that what Jesus was taking was Peter's words, Peter's affirmation of faith. This is the rock, the rock that asserts, this, this, this declaration that asserts my deity and my messiahship will be the, the basis for the church that I want to build. But you know, that moment must have always been in Peter's mind. When Christ said, on this rock, I'll build my church. Peter is saying now to the people that he's writing to, you're stones in that church. That's built on the cornerstone of Jesus, but rises as a magnificent building, figuratively, metaphorically, a magnificent building that proclaims the faith that you and I share. This is bigger than anything you and I could possibly imagine. It's what God had in mind for us all along. Let's pray together.
Lord, we're not worthy of any of the good things we receive from you. We read this passage and we say, that can't be us. You can't mean that about us. But you do. You're not through with us. You have more to do in us. But you're already using us. You're already seeing us as living stones in this metaphorical building that represents your very literal church around the world. Thank you for this corner of it that we call alive. Thank you for all the other churches represented by those who may be visiting here today or may be watching online out of their congregations. Thank you for those churches. Thank you most of all for the cornerstone of it all in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. May this metaphor come to life as our church honors him. In Jesus' name, amen.